Hello, everybody. I'm Sheila Payne. I'm an Emeritus Professor at the International Observatory on End of Life Care at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. And it's my privilege to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the European Association for Palliative Care. The EAPC are partners in an Erasmus Plus funded project called RESPAC. And RESPAC stands for Palliative Care Research, Attitudes, Communication and Competence. And it aims to um, help clinicians with developing clinical research in palliative care contexts. And today we're going to invite Professor Catherine Walsh, who is Head of Department um, in Lancaster University and is also co-director of the International Observatory on End of Life Care. She also has the role of Editor-in-Chief at Palliative Medicine, so is very well qualified to talk about how to get your research published in um, academic journals and professional journals. Catherine is going to speak to us for about an hour, but she won't be taking questions. Instead, we'll invite you to put any questions or queries you have in the chat or in the Q&A section. And um, Stephen, Mason and I tomorrow will do a seminar in the morning in which we'll address um, some of these questions and some of the issues that arise from Catherine. So a warm welcome to Catherine and over to you now. Thank you very much, Sheila, and I'm delighted to be joining you all today. So I do have some slides to share, so hopefully these are just coming up now for you. So welcome, as Sheila's already said, and uh, I'm delighted to be joining you today. And as we've already said, I'm bringing a number of different perspectives today. So I'm an editor. I'm an author, I'm a reviewer, and I'm a reader. So I think I bring a number of different perspectives, but I guess if I'm being honest today, I am primarily bringing my uh, editor perspective. And what are the sorts of things that I and the colleagues who work on the journal with me are looking for when we are um, assessing a paper for publication? So I'm going to be primarily focusing on uh, research publications and by research I mean um, what papers that report empirical data but also uh, data from uh, systematically constructed reviews. You might have questions about other sorts of papers if you do pop those in the chat and I'm sure uh, Sheila and Steve will be able to talk about those tomorrow. So we've only got an hour so I've encapsulated this as my top 10 tips. We can't cover everything, so it is going to be a little bit of a whistle stop tour. So, uh, but hopefully the 10 tips that I have selected are going to be helpful to you when you're thinking about your journal publications. So, first of all, let's start at number one tip. And number one tip is about the science underpinning the work. And I think it's probably the most important thing I'm going to say today. So I'm uh, not obviously Maria in the sound of music and I'm not climbing every mountain, although I would love to be up in the mountains at the moment. But rather I'm echoing here Maria's entreaty for those who know the film to start at the very beginning. And as she would say, it's a very good place to start. And the reason I'm suggesting that is because you can't write a great paper if you haven't started with great science. Good writing will enhance a great study, but even the best writers can't make a poorly designed study better. If you don't have the skills and knowledge to do great or good research, but you do have a really good research idea, make sure that you are seeking help from research experts to help you design and think about that study. So as an editor, I'm looking for a really important question, but answered with an appropriate design that is well executed. And if I look, and I've, I've, I've uh, looked at some of the comments that the editors uh, write when we're appraising papers for publication, and just to reassure you, we read 
every single paper that's submitted to palliative medicine and normally between two and four editors will read every paper before we decide whether something's going to go out for review or not. And the sorts of comments that the editors might make, and I've just summarised these, these are not actually real comments, but you can see from these comments that although we might talk about writing, without the core of good science, it won't get published. So if you look at this example of feedback from screening editors of the journal, the science underpinning the paper and the justification of those choices are really important. I know lots of people worry about their writing and worry if English is not their first language. We can work with that. We can support you in that. But we cannot change the science that you have already done. So it might sound obvious, but it really is the great starting point for a really good paper. Right, going on to tip two. And tip two is actually about understanding the positioning of your paper. What do I mean by positioning? Well, whilst palliative care is a less established specialty than some other specialties, nevertheless, there's now a lot of published research and that increases year on year. Your paper, you have to understand where your paper sits within that body of knowledge, what space it occupies. Ideally, not just thinking about the palliative care literature, but because of the nature of our specialty, some useful um, research might sit in wider clinical literature or in psychology, sociology or whatever. You have to understand where that fits so that you are making the case for why the work that you have done is important. So if you want to, your work published, you have to understand what the gap in knowledge is. And by that, I mean, you have to understand what is already known, but also have a good appreciation of what is not yet known. But the additional thing I'd say with that is actually it's not just about understanding the gap. Just because there's a gap in knowledge doesn't mean to say that that gap has to be filled by research. You also have to understand the purpose of what you're doing. Why should something be known? So it has to be clear what the paper adds, what it offers. And there's only one person that's going to know that really, and that's you. The reader should not be doing that work. You should be doing that work for the reader. You have to articulate it and know it for yourself. And that doesn't mean, for example, that a replication study isn't worthwhile, but you have to know why you're replicating a study and what that replication will add to knowledge. So what is known, what is not known, and why we need to know it. They're three really important things. And I would say when you are writing your paper, and we'll talk about some tips about writing later, they are the three things that you clearly need to articulate in the background or introduction to the paper that you are writing. Let's go on to tip three. Tip three is to write for an international audience. And now, actually, I think you should be doing that anyway. I think that's actually really important. Yeah. But it's particularly important if you want to submit your work to an internationally read journal. So the journal I edit, Party of Medicine, is very much focused at an international audience. In fact, we know that um, the last time the publisher Sage looked at the accesses to the website, that the website had been accessed by something like 95% of countries or people within countries has accessed the website. So if we publish your paper, it will be read globally. So it has to be understood and contextualized globally. Now, this doesn't mean that your research is necessarily multinational, although it can be, but rather that you appreciate that you need to think about how you position your work. 
referring to international literature and explaining your terms for that international audience. Don't make assumptions. It's easy to assume that people understand what you mean by key terms or key policies, but the chances are they might not. So context is everything. We know our own culture and context generally, but your readers often do not. So you have to explain things so that they are obvious to that international readership. Now, it might be obvious to you how healthcare is funded, for example, in your own country, or what you mean by a particular service. Chances are I as editor and certainly the readers may not understand that at all. It's not obvious to an international readership. So even the widely used terms such as hospice often mean something different in the way that it's operationalized in particular contexts and cultures. So you have to explain that and you might think, gosh, I'm explaining something pretty obvious, but it's not necessarily obvious to that international audience. So position your study so it can be read and its implications understood internationally. And then you're going to be reaching that wider audience. And I can also say that the screening editors of the journal are much more likely to say, oh gosh, this is a paper that is written for our audience. This is a paper that speaks to our audience. This is a paper that we're going to send out for review to begin with and then hopefully to publish. So it's really important. And But if you look at most of the papers we publish, they're still only set, not only, because there's nothing wrong with that, set in one country. So it's, it's absolutely fine for it to be Romanian research, Irish research, English research, Belgian research, but you've got to contextualize it for that international audience. So let's think about tip four. And tip four is to plan early in the project for the papers that you write and what audience you're writing for. Now, clearly, I'm here with a particular hat on for a particular sort of journal, but I don't publish all my work in palliative care journals, for example. So you do have to think quite carefully about that. But it's not just about the type of journal. Planning is essential right from the beginning. So, for example, you can't submit a paper to a journal that requires, for example, a trial registration if you haven't registered your trial to begin with. Now, in lots of countries, you don't necessarily have to register a trial and that can be absolutely fine, although we would consider it to be good practice. But you can't submit it to a journal that requires trial registration if you've not done that. So you've got to think about some of the journal requirements and that good science requirement right from the very beginning. So think about the publications that are planned. Does that include the protocol, methods or methodology paper, for example? Start thinking early about how many results papers there could be. Now, when you don't know the findings, you can't exactly plan that, but you get a, a fair idea relatively early on about the sorts of messages there could be and what their focus. But the reason for the picture of the salami, obviously, is what we call salami slicing and advising against slicing the results too thinly. Now, it's tempting when you're working with journals that have relatively tight word counts, and obviously I appreciate that part of medicine has quite a tight word count, to get around that by writing multiple papers. But I would advise against that where at all possible, because it's really frustrating for readers who have to read lots of papers for the fullest understanding of your study. It also increases the risk of self-plagiarism, and can lead to what I'm going to call a relatively thin paper. And editors are much less interested in a paper if it reports, and they can see that it's reporting, only a fraction of the findings from a larger study. So there's a balance, you know, we're not expecting necessarily that every finding to be in one paper, but thinking carefully and clearly about that, how that's divided up and thinking about how that maps on to the different audiences that you might be looking to attract 
and the different messages of your paper. And even so, when you write a paper, please, the whole thing in terms of the methods has to report it. The most common reviewer comment that I see is when somebody has said, um, you know, you can read up about the methods of this paper of this study in paper X. And they say, I don't want to read paper X. I need to understand enough about how you've conducted the study robustly here now in this paper. So we're very commonly asking people to add more methods details. So you might as well plan for that right from the very beginning when you're allocating your word count and thinking about what you're going to be writing. Remember though, that writing is a team effort. And you also have to decide in advance who will lead on writing each paper, what people's roles are, and of course, if they meet the generally accepted criteria for authorship. And I just say, think about this early in project teams. So let's think about tip five. Tip five is related to tip four, and it's about thinking about the audience that you want to reach with your paper. So there are multiple audiences for palliative care papers. You might want to reach a palliative care specific audience, but it could be that you think, actually, this is a great paper for a general clinical audience. You might have a specific type of clinician that you want to reach, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, social care workers. You might want to reach policymakers. And you've got to think about that in terms of the journal, because if there's one thing I do know about journals, it's that often the type and style of writing can be different for different forms of journal. So you have to think about that quite carefully when you're positioning it. So then think then about which journals might reach particular audiences. Now you think, does that really matter anymore in our modern world of online publishing and Google Scholar? So you will increasingly find papers that um, are not published in your field specific journals, but you'll find them. So if I went into Google Scholar and looked for palliative care literature, I know that not all of it will be published in a palliative care journal, which is absolutely fine. And you do want to work with a journal that works with you to make sure that if somebody does that search, your paper is pretty high up in that ranking. But I would say, nevertheless, individual journals still have clear aims and scope. And if your paper doesn't meet the aims and scope of that journal, then they're not going to publish it. And with my editor's hat on, I would say that we still get a reasonably high proportion of papers submitted, probably only about two or three or four percent. I'm not thinking loads of papers, but that's still a relatively high number of papers in terms of the total number of papers that we get that are nothing to do with palliative care. And so we immediately say no. So you've wasted your time in terms of formatting it and the editors and screening editors and well, it wouldn't get as far as reviewers, but potentially reviewers time if you're submitting it to a journal that clearly doesn't fit. There are edge things and I'm going to give you some examples of where I've got it wrong as well in terms of sending things to a journal that clearly wasn't interested in the work that I was doing. So tip six, and we're getting on to more of the specifics now, and I'm going to cover some of this in a, in a little bit more detail when we get on to the writing. But six th tip six is about thinking carefully about the story or narrative of your paper and what its core message is. So I don't think, or I certainly hope, that your papers are not fictional stories. They're not going to be starting once upon a time. But there is still a really important craft in thinking about the core message of the paper and what you want readers to understand from your work. How can you pace your reader through the paper so that they can clearly understand why the study's been done, what you did, your core findings, and why they are important. 
if you can't articulate this clearly, then your readers are unlikely to understand either. So you do need to think quite care carefully, and this isn't just about the purpose of the paper, but about the narrative within the paper. Remember as a writer that you make a lot of these connections in your head. And even with experienced writers, you sometimes forget to make those connections. So I will write a paper, send it out to my co-authors at you know in first draft for them to have a look at it and they'll still go through with lots of queries and questions i don't see the connection between this or you go in this paragraph from this to this is there not a bit of an argument here in the middle that you need to make and pretty much always they're right and they're right because i know that i understand those connections but i've made them in my brain rather than on the paper so it's really important to get that story right, the building blocks of the story to move it around. What is the logical order in which that you're going to present the information? So this is true, particularly in the background or introduction sections when you're building that argument for why this paper is important and you need to carry the reader with you. Because I can tell you, I read a lot of papers where I get to the end of the introduction or the background section, I'm going, I don't, I'm not quite sure what they're doing here or, or, or what is the argument that they're creating about why this paper is important and why this research needs to be done. But equally, when you're writing findings, you have to think about that narrative, that story, because you can present the findings in a number of different order. There is not, sometimes there's a temporal logic to what you're doing. This happens first and then this and then this. But actually, mostly you are making a choice. So if, for example, you're reporting qualitative research, what theme do you present first if you've developed themes? Uh, what comes second? What comes third? What is the logical order for that? But the same is also true for trials or quantitative papers. What are the key findings that you present first? Do you give everything at once or do you just talk about your, your core key findings and then the rest is in supplementary materials, for example? You have to think about the narrative that you are weaving. You also have to put that across in a clear, simple, elegant matter manner it's not about dumbing down but it's about the clarity of your messaging and that normally means straightforward language using technical language only if there is no other way of describing something and probably with no or few abbreviations or acronyms and i would add here certainly not if you want to publish in palliative medicine because i'm red hot on striking those out of pretty much every paper remembering what i've said earlier about most of our audience being people for whom english is not their first language and in fact um over lunch before i started here i was just doing a bit of scrolling of twitter and was um nodding enthusiastically with somebody who tweeted that they were three quarters of the way through a paper before they understood what one of the abbreviations or acronyms meant and then everyone responded to that tweet it was a tweet about the acronym em so what does that mean people were saying electron microscope emergency medicine i can't remember what it meant now but it was neither of those things and the same is also true in our own specialty what does pc mean personal computer palliative care primary care i can tell you it gets used for all of those in papers submitted to the journal don't do it it makes your work really hard to read if you're doing it to shave word count then you need to shave the word count somewhere else because otherwise you're just going to get feedback to change it anyway and still to re maintain within the, the, the word count. So you have to understand what you're saying because as Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. You have to be really clear about what you're writing and then it will come through in your presentation. But remember, writing does not come easy to many of us. It is a complex craft that you have to invest some time in. 
just like you practice if you're a clinician clinical skills for them to become second nature so when i trained as a nurse we did i don't know however many injections injection after injection after injection not on real people to begin with until we had sufficient clinical skill for them to be relatively competent and for them to think that i could actually give an injection without you know causing untoward damage but so too you have to practice writing why do we think that just because we you know it writing is something that we all learn from primary school as in this picture that somehow we can suddenly transfer that to writing to describe the research that we've done it takes practice it takes feedback it takes work so you have to invest time in it and you've got to be open to feedback and to be open to that critique and I would also add to that, you have to be ruthless with your editing. So it's often necessary not just to tinker at the edges, changing the odd word here or there, but at times I've had a complete root and branch rewrite of a paragraph, the ordering of paragraphs, even what I've been writing. And that's painful. I've had, you know, I might have spent hours crafting what I thought was the most perfect paragraph. But if it doesn't work for somebody else, or if it's not needed to narrate the story of your paper, it can be just cut out and lost. And you've got to be aware of that. And that's why planning the messaging of your paper early is really important. There are some writing exercises that can really help with that. And this is one that I actually quite recommend and I use quite often with uh, some students because it's often perfectly possible to encapsulate the core of an argument in relatively few words. We tend quite often in our writing to use padding words without even realizing that's what we're doing. So here you start with 500 words, you make it 100 words, you make it 50 words. Now, there are times in your argumentation when you decide that those 50 words are A, all that will fit, or B, all that are needed for somebody to make sense of the argument that you're making. There are times where a carefully crafted 500 words is exactly what's needed to put across complex ideas in a nuanced way. So it's not always about completely passing something down to its absolute minimum, but it's being very clear about how you have to do that and the techniques we tend to use in writing, which actually pad things out. A lot of howevers, therefores, padding words, and usually you can take a sentence and cut out 50% of the words and it still makes sense. Now you might need to craft it a little bit different, differently so it's elegantly written. But again, it is about working with your own writing over and over and over so that it makes sense and is succinct and elegant. Remembering that we still, as I've already said, sometimes have to put across quite complex ideas. So it's not just about simplicity, but it's about that nuance and having the space in your writing to put that nuance across. Just a quick um, advert here for this blog, which I'm a particular uh, fan of. It's, it's not my blog, um, but it's a really great blog on writing paragraphs using the building blocks of topic, body, token and wrap. I'm not going to go into that uh, in detail now, but it does help to take some of your own paragraphs. And again, I've done this before and colour code them. Do you have a topic sentence? Do you have the body and the tokens within the paragraph? Do you have a wrap sentence? See if those essential features are present. And if they're not present because of the way that we speed read things, it's likely that your paragraphs are not as understandable as they could be. So I highly recommend having a look for that blog, reading it and practicing some of those. I'm going to move on now to tip seven. And you might think we'd already talked about writing, but actually the seventh tip of mine is to plan your writing carefully. And here I'm not talking so much about the craft of writing in terms of words, paragraphs, sentences and logical order. I'm actually talking much more about actually finding time for your writing. 
because for most of us, we are not writing 100% of the time. We're fitting writing in with lots of other commitments. And you need to think about what type of writer you are. Can you only write effectively when you've got a whole day to run at something? Or do you prefer to write in smaller chunks? And I would say, practically, often a bit of both is helpful. But if you think you're the sort of writer that can only run at things with a whole day, you're probably going to struggle because very few of us can manage to create an entire day for writing. So you have to learn how to write in chunks as well, because if you're waiting for a large chunk of time and don't even tell me that you want a week or a month to write, because certainly in my diary, that's an almost impossible ask. If you're waiting for a big chunk of a time to appear, you're probably going to be waiting forever. You'll never start writing and that paper will never fly into the journal. So here I would say that perfection is the enemy of done. There is no such thing as a perfect paper. There is only a written paper and then a submitted paper and then an accepted paper. And the accepted papers are not perfect either. So you have to work out how you're going to find your time for writing. And I know a lot of people are a particular fan of what they call the Pomodoro technique. And it is actually named after a tomato kitchen timer. And it's about writing in 25 minute, highly focused chunks of time. Now, I actually quite like doing this. It doesn't get a whole paper written, but it gets me starting writing. And um, in the dim and distant time pre pandemic, when we were working much more together, occasionally we'd go off for 25 minutes as a team and just write in an empty space no computers on one of you preferred to type, no email, no mobile phones, no nothing, just 25 minutes of getting something down on paper. And it's actually amazing how much you can write in that 25 minutes and how much writing that uh, without any other distractions can be incredibly helpful for freeing up the writing flow, getting your creative juices um, running and enabling you to think that you can actually write something. And it's quite possible as well to just give yourself permission occasionally to write the paper in chunks. The methods section, for example, is a great way of doing that. You know, whatever your techniques, the, the methods section often has parts to it. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So you can give yourself permission in 25 minutes to just write one part and you'll probably surprise yourself and write that in five or 10 minutes. And then you've got another 10 minutes to write the next part. And before you know it, the method section or whatever section is written, whatever your techniques, procrastination, as I've said, is the enemy of writing. You just have to get out there, get writing, get sharing your writing, however imperfect it is, knowing that it's very exposing to share your writing with other people, but also knowing it's the only way to get it done. OK, moving on now to tip eight. And tip eight is actually at the core of writing a paper, and it's what I call the eight sentences rule. And it's a great way to think about what we were talking about earlier about the key messages of a paper, but also to start writing when all that is facing you is a blank sheet of paper. And there's nothing worse writing when all you have is a blank sheet of paper. So here are my eight sentences. And what I suggest to begin writing is you start with your blank piece of paper and you write each of these eight sentences down. What do we know already? What don't we know yet? Why do we need to know this? What is the research question? And it might be a literature review question. What is your design? Why is this your design? What did you find and why is it important? You could do it in a table. Anyone that works with me knows I'm a big fan of tables. Write them all down. And on the other side, you write one sentence. That's all that I'm asking that you write one sentence about every single one of those. And I would suggest that each of those sentences to begin with is no more than, say, 10 words. 
I might give you 15 if I'm being generous. So all your writing to begin with is 80 words or so. Great for a Pomodoro session. You can probably write those 80 words in that 25 minutes that you have given yourself and give yourself the core of the paper. So it's not thinking about the complexities of writing the discussion. It's not thinking about what you're going to weave into the introduction. It's quite literally 80 words or so that is the core of your paper. And if you can carefully and clearly write those eight sentences, then you can start expanding out from that. It's really great for writer's block. And indeed, you know, if you work on those sentences, then add some bullet points to that. So what do we know already? OK, so you've written one sentence. You can probably then think about putting some bullet points underneath that. What are the five or six main things that we already know? They could expand to be perhaps a paragraph. Some of them might actually be amalgamated to be one paragraph. Play around with the ordering of it. So when you're playing around with the order, all you're playing around with is a bullet point. It's not quite so painful as having to lose an entire paragraph that you've crafted, but it's an important part of iterating the story, moving on so that you can build on that, then to become those carefully crafted paragraphs and sentences so that you have a structured plan for the whole paper. And again, I've placed those eight within what goes around it we've already really spoken about. It has to be underpinned by robust science. It's got to have clear, elegant, plain language, no jargon, no abbreviations. You need to be writing for a general audience. Thinking, even if it's in a specialist journal like palliative medicine, we know that generalists will also be writing it. So don't write for somebody that only understands your particular niche and you've got to iterate the story tell the story well and i know from feedback from people that thinking about this in terms of the eight questions 80 words bullet points underneath each of those as a starting structure can really help to bring out the entire paper and to start crafting that tip nine then actually builds on that to ensure that your paper has a clear and logical structure. Because we know, sadly, there's a lot more to writing a great paper than just eight sentences or eight sections. So there has to be that clear scaffolding to your paper and bringing your readers to that structure in a way that is logical, carefully builds your argument and makes sense to the reader. And here I would carefully say, don't reinvent the wheel. There are lots of people that are much cleverer than I that have thought through what you need to put in particular types of paper. So here I would strongly suggest that you have a look at the Equator Network um, website, which is a repository of every reporting guideline for every different sort of paper, pretty much. There are some sorts that don't yet have reporting guidelines, but there are more being added all the time. So have a look. It might be that something has been added since the last time you had a look. So each reporting guideline gives a guide to the content to be covered within each section. And I strongly suggest that you really engage with them carefully. They're not just a tick box exercise. They're a really great way of thinking about what you're writing and where it could best be placed. So if, for example, I was writing a qualitative paper, I might look at uh, there's two or three guides for writing qualitative um, papers, COREC or uh, SRQR, and I might print both of them out and have them, I'm saying this because I'm sitting at my desk, either side of the desk and have a look, because it's really easy sometimes to overlook something. And I've done it myself. I have submitted a paper to a journal before now where they rejected it and sent it back saying, you haven't told us who the participants are in this study. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean I haven't? I hadn't. I would completely omitted the table of participants and because I hadn't really engaged at that 
particular time with a particular checklist and they were quite right they were quite right to reject it because i hadn't given them that information and because i knew it i knew who the participants were and in my head i had made that connection don't do that make it really really clear um and i think you know i'm just going to go through some of the sort of this is a me trying to praise for example, and this is just an example, they cover the whole paper, but methods is, is one of the easiest things to structure. And also, to be honest, it's often the thing that I think readers might not look at, but editors do. So if you think about it, a reader probably just wants to know what you found, what its implications are, do they need to make a difference to practice? An editor, however, does look at this section quite carefully because they want to make sure that the research that you're reporting has been carefully conduct conducted and there aren't any glaring limitations that you haven't identified. So make it easy for them to find what they're looking for. Now, remember, the structure will not be the same for every type of study. But so this is a typical outline that I've sort of constructed that covers many, but not every type of paper. Because as an editor, I quite often find the method section jumbled up um, and the most common thing is mixing sampling and recruitment or confusing population and participants so that it's really hard to follow what's been done to whom and why and has it been done in an ethical way. So again, in the way that my eight questions was my simplification, this is my simplification, clearly it needs more than this, of what you might want to put in a um, methods section. Obviously, if it's a trial, you need to describe the intervention, et cetera. So this isn't, it's not one size fits all, but I hope it gives some clues to the sorts of things that we might want splitting out. And although in part of medicine, we don't ask that this has to have subheadings, increasingly I'm suggesting, or my editors are suggesting to, to authors that they do sp split it out and put in some subheadings because actually it makes it much easier to follow. So remember, research design is not, and here I'm going to pick up on the, the common things that I might see, is not data collection. So your research design is not, we did interviews with. Your research design will have some sort of overarching um, design or research strategy. And you might want to briefly mention some of the epistemological, ontological and methodological considerations that have led you to that design. Again, thinking perhaps about population, the population is the description of the people, say the patients that you're working with, that you wanted to study, thinking about the clear inclusion and exclusion criteria. And it's really common for those criteria to be missed out of um, papers that are submitted. And you think, well, I don't really understand who they, who they wanted to take part in this. Then how you actually sampled potential participants from that wider population, and then in recruitment, how you actually approach them and inform them about the study. Again, not every study will follow this particular manner of recruiting uh, or sampling participants, but I hope it gives you an idea of the sorts of things that we might be looking for. And as I say, for an editor, this section is really important because they might be the most important findings in the world, but if we think that your study isn't robust, then we're still probably likely to say no, because we cannot realistically think that the findings are sufficiently robust. So it's really important to nail this. The other thing that's really important is actually the title. And you could probably spend one of those 25 minute Pomodoro sessions thinking about your title as well. And remember, there's a structure to titles and titles are important because when you search for a paper, it's often the first thing you'll find. If you look on Google Scholar, for example, it's mostly the title that gets presented. If you look on PubMed, the first thing you see is the title. If you're searching for something, you're more likely to get back papers that have your search terms in the title. So your title should focus on the key message of your paper using, if possible, keywords or mesh headings, depending on the sort of um, databases you think it might be indexed in to enhance that discoverability. 
There is clear evidence that putting a country name in the title puts a wider readership off, so don't do it. But do include methods information in your title so the readers understand the approach and it's a great clue to the type of findings that you might be presenting. So a title that goes something like paracetamol is better than aspirin for the control of headaches in palliative care patients, colon, a randomised control trial, already starts to give the reader an understanding that this is a trial, that one has been tested against the other, and that actually there is a finding to this which goes in a particular direction. So there's a lot of clues in that title. However, a title that might be something like participants or patients' um, perspectives on uh, pain control for headaches in palliative care might give you an under colon, I don't know, a, um, I don't know, an ethnographic study or something, I'm making this up now, gives you a clue that this is going to be a qualitative piece of work, likely but not inevitably using some sort of qualitative data technique like an interview, exploring people's perspection, perspectives and experiences of something. So whilst the core topic area, the research problem might be similar, what do we do about headaches in palliative care, the title goes a long way to helping you to understand the type of study that's been done and the type of finding uh, that they discovered. So titles are really important, as indeed are abstracts. And make sure that you spend time writing your abstract as well, because for many readers, that's as far as they get, title and abstract. Um, either because they don't, they don't have access, and let's not go into open access and closed access, but they don't have access to the paper, or they think they know everything they need to know from the abstract. So it's actually really important. And of course, it's the first thing that the editor will read as well, the title and the abstract. So you've got to get those key messages across. It's very important. I'm going to talk briefly now about discussions, because again, that's one of the challenging sections of a paper, because it's the next blank piece of paper. So I'd also strongly suggest that you want to think about structuring your dis discussion, because again, if you start with those four bullet points that I've suggested on the slide, um, it gives you a starting point. You can then write some sub bullet points underneath each of those, start expanding on the key points that you're going to make underneath each of those before you actually start carefully constructing your narrative, your prose. Some journals and palliative medicine does will suggest a particular structure and if they do follow it because that's quite helpful. But then you can play around with the logical order of your argument and then and only then you could start fleshing that out so the reader can clearly understand what you're talking about and why this study is important, but also some of the strengths and limitations of what they've done and some clear action points. Because often a discussion is either A, a representation of findings, which is not what we want, or B, doesn't actually make some clear uh, conclusions and doesn't position the work they've done more widely so somebody understands the importance or otherwise of the work. So finally, top tip 10, Gosh, that was hard to say and that's actually about how to address reviewer comments because I know from uh, people posting questions before the seminar that was one of the things that people wanted me to cover. So you might feel like you need a hard hat when you get reviewer comments. They're not always easy to read but actually reviewer comments are great to receive. If an editor has asked for a revise and resubmit with reviewer comments, what they're saying is, I'm really interested in this paper. It's a yes, but do this and we're probably going to publish your paper. However, I, I have lost count of the number of people who tell me that they've had reviewer comments back on a paper um, had a little bit of a weep, and I think we've all done that, or gnashed our teeth or got angry, put them in the metaphorical drawer and never opened the drawer again because they have interpreted the reviewer comments as a no. 
but they're not. If if it's a no, the editor will say no. It's a yes, but. So don't put them in that drawer. Don't ignore them. Don't think it's a no. It might need a little bit of resilience, but do persevere. And I'm going to share with you an example of, of, of some of my own perseverance. So because we all get revisions to address, we all get rejections. And this is a picture of my whiteboard in a previous building, not the glossy new one that's behind me now. Um, and I took it to remind myself of where I was up to two years ago, just as we were sent to work from home when COVID hit. And it was tracking the status of a number of papers that I was involved with at the time. So down the middle are the acronyms of the papers. On the left are the journals from which the papers had been rejected. And you can see one of them has seven rejections. On the right are where they were currently sitting and if a revision had been requested. Now, two years later, and it's almost exactly two years, isn't it? Every single one of those papers has been published. Now, they didn't go to the first, well, few of them might have been accepted by the first journal. Most of them were not. Um, but you can see the one that was rejected by uh, seven other journals. Now, I think, and perhaps I would say this, I thought it was a great paper and it landed in a great journal, a JPSM Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, fantastic journal. But it required resilience and perseverance to turn it around and get it published. Now, this is a key example of me thinking it was going to go to a particular audience and I wanted it to go to a general audience to begin with or an audience for a, a people working in ageing and gerontology. And ultimately, I had to sort of swallow that ambition and say, do you know what? It is only flying with the palliative care audience. So let's send it to the palliative care audience. But um, it didn't matter in some senses because actually the rejections, the turnarounds were relatively fast. It's an issue I understand if they're not fast. And because I had the techniques in place to allow me to uh, respond to that relatively quickly. So here I'd say reference management software is definitely your friend. So I can switch things from Harvard to Vancouver and back again several times at the touch of the button, probably saving hours or days of time. I use EndNote because the university um, support that, but there are other software, including free software. So use it because site as you write and being able to change referencing is a fantastic time saving tool when we're talking about reviews and reviewing. So in terms of some tips for responding to reviewer comments, other than, you know, you can change things at a touch of a button here. It's not a reject. We've got some comments back. So please respond to every suggestion. I do see reviewer responses coming back where they haven't and they've only engaged with some of the suggestions. Reviewers will disagree and that's fine. And unless it's something particularly strange or outrageous, I'm unlikely to tell you which of the reviewers I agree with if they're disagreeing, because I'm looking for you to tell me your position on the issue being debated, your ownership of that, your justification of why you're taking a particular position or stating something in particular. And I will expect you in your reviewers comments to say, actually, I agree with reviewer one. I disagree with reviewer two. But this is why. But I do get a lot of um, well, not a lot, but, you know, some people approach me or feedback saying, how can I address both of these comments? The answer is, of course, you can't, but it's your work. And so the editors are not going to say, I agree with this or this, because actually sometimes we can be have a neutral stance. We're looking for what you want to say and what is your ownership of your response to that. If you think the reviewer is misunderstood, that's fine. And we all get annoyed with that. That's when I have to put my hard hat on that I showed you earlier. You think, I've said that already. Why? What? You mean it says that on page three, line 47? How can you be not understanding that? But it probably means that I've not explained it well enough. So even if you're not changing the uh, fact of what you've said, you still might need to rewrite it to clarify something for the reviewer, for the editor, for the reader. Because if they haven't understood, we clearly haven't written it simply, elegantly, well enough. Always consider if the reviewer is correct or not. So even if they're not disagreeing with each other, you might disagree with them. 
and it's absolutely fine to refute what they've said. You are the expert in the work that you've done. But if you do refute it, and I really like refutations, it means you've really engaged with the argument, you have to tell me why. It's no good to just say, I disagree with reviewer one, because I'm going, oh, okay, why? So you have to give justification for that, and you have to give evidence for that. But also if you think, okay, if the reviewer disagrees with what I say, might the readers think that as well? Is there something I need to add into the paper so that the readers understand as well a little bit more about where I'm coming from? So this is why I'm saying you respond to every suggestion and every suggestion might need a change in the paper just to explain something a little bit better, to reword it, to add some justification perhaps. Check if you get any leeway on word count. So if not, you have to stick with it, even with revisions. And that's why your succinct writing is really important here, because it's rare for a reviewer to ask you to take something out. They're normally asking you to put something in. So again, you know, editors sometimes have a little bit of leeway. I have slightly more leeway now in palliative medicine um, because I don't have quite so much of a, an absolute word count for every print issue. Um, but we're still looking for relatively succinct papers because that's what the readers tell me that they prefer. Um, and sometimes you'll get editors' comments as well. And if the editor asks you to do something, unless they're really off beam, as I've written here, and we're not infallible, do it. Um, because they know their journal, they know their authorship, they know what might fly. If you really think it's off beam, then I, I quite enjoy engaging with, with, with authors and having a respectful conversation about it. But there are some things I am not going to give leeway on. For example, acronyms and abbreviations, they are going to be out. You have to have a really good argument for why something might need to go in. So finally, I'm gonna, recommend this as a as a particular uh, what's the word such a flow chart it's not really flow chart can't think of the right word now which you will find on twitter and i've acknowledged it here because it's actually a really nice simple way of encapsulating much of the presentation that i've given today so I hope that was of some interest. As I say, it's a whiffle stop uh, tour through publishing. Um, now, just a quick reminder that uh, Sheila Payne and Stephen Mason are running the seminar tomorrow, uh, which is going to pick up on questions and debates and discussion following on from this. But I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope it gave you some um, insight into some of the publication. If you've got any particular queries, particularly about palliative medicine, please email me. I'm happy to answer them. But thank you very much.